morning, everybody. Good to see you today. And uh, this is part eight of our series that we've been doing, uh, building our lives on love. And I was going to just speak this morning, but Robin and I had such great conversation uh, yesterday about this, and this morning even, uh, that I, I wanted us to do it together again. I kind of like her. <laughs> But, well, thank uh, you. You're I like you too. Thank you. Uh, but uh, I think there's just a different dynamic sometimes of of us having conversation, uh, and so I hope some of our stuff that we've been talking about is going to come out this morning. Yep. So, uh, Father, we just thank you that as we uh, open up the scriptures today, that Father, that we have the ability to comprehend and understand and go just a little deeper in our relationship with you than we ever have before. We have ears to hear, eyes to see. We have the ability to be able to speak, uh, Father, words from, from your very existence because you exist on the inside of us. And Father, we, uh, we don't take that lightly. We thank you that you will never leave us, never forsake us. You will always love us. And Father, you will help us on this journey that we call life. And I thank you for that in yes. Jesus' name. Everybody that agreed said, Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk just a little bit more about the love of God and what it looks like to build our lives on love. And Robin, you and I, are we've been saying all the time that our understanding of the love of God should determine how we look at our doctrine. Yes. Our doctrine should not determine how we see the love of God. And some of the things that we're going to say this morning is really going to be tweaking on that big time. Yes. And so, so we've been talking about the fact that we're in a construction zone, building a healthy view of God, building a healthy view of ourselves, and building a healthy view of others. But Robin, that really begins with our, our understanding of who God is. Yeah. And once we begin to put our stake in the ground about this love thing, then it causes everything else to be subject to uh, the love of God. And as we're constructing, as I've been saying, sometimes construction zones are very messy, uh, you know, not only in the demolition of what we thought was true, but in the rebuilding back of what is truth that will allow our lives to build something that is wonderful and fabulous. And I think the name of our message this morning is called Simply Love. And I think sometimes when we really take our foundational doctrines that we've believed and we really start saying, looking at them and saying, maybe we've not looked at these quite the wrong way, right, right way. And I think sometimes we think, well, what am I going to have left with? I've built everything I believe around some of these central truths. And to look at them differently can be a little bit overwhelming. And the terminology is cognizant dissonance. It's, it's, whoa, that's fancy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Would you want to explain that? It just means that your mind almost checks out whenever you have too many thought processes that change, like believing that God was ever angry to believing that God has never been angry. That a lot of people in their mind, they just can't, they can't handle it. Well, because then a lot of times to that note, because we have, have built our relationship around God about a, as a fear-based relationship, right. it's been about trying to escape punishment from a God that we believed was angry with us yeah. about our performance, then when you take fear out of the equation, when that's been our motivating factor has been fear, then you're like what you're just talking about, what how do I relate to God? Right. I mean, yes, we've heard God loves us, but if it's just simply love and yeah. there's no fear in love, it's like what you were reading yeah. this morning. If there is no fear in love, it's about what we were singing about today. It's about that he turns our shame into glory. There's no fear in worrying about our performance. If that's what it's based upon, man, then we have a whole, yeah. we have to, we have to reconstruct everything that we believe. Everything that we believe. And we have to construct it on relating to God, not through fear of punishment, 
but through a loving papa who cares about us yeah. and, it, and that regardless of our performance. But man, we've been so taught to, to believe that if we weren't afraid of punishment, then our performance would be bad. Right. And I believe it's been really proven out to be just the opposite, that I believe that when we operate and live in our lives from a place of fear, fear of punishment, it actually gets us focusing on our negative performance and we, our performance actually gets worse instead sure. of better. And that is when we focus on our identity and who we are and the fact that God loves us and we simply get it down to love. And that's what we're building our lives on. I believe are the quality of our lives and the quality of our choices improve instead of get worse. Well, Robin, Paul even said that it's the love of God that constrains us or restrains us. Yes. It's the love of God. It's not rules and laws. And so over the last few weeks, every week we've been reading a scripture where Jesus is modeling love, where he is moved with con compassion. Right. Uh, you remember that word for compassion? No, go ahead. I, you, it's a tough one, so you I'm go I'm not going to say it because I don't Splanks. have it in front of me. Splank. Whoa. There you go. Splank. Wow. <laughs> Splank nids That's awesome. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> to have so bowels. Of, that, it's from yes, their innermost it's being. It's from your comes. innermost yes. being. Bowels so, of compassion. So Jesus moved with compassion towards people that were struggling. Yeah. And so um, uh, this morning we want to read out of Mark 9 and 10 where Jesus is telling uh, the disciples that they need to have a different mindset in order to really experience life with the Father. And that's what you and I have yeah. been talking about the last couple of days in, in our time together. And so uh, I believe we have to come to the same trusting openness as we're reading the scriptures that a child has. We have to believe that our Father is simply love. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us what love isn't, but there are three things that it tells us what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, and love never fails. Everybody say that. Love is patient, kind, and never fails. And that's what our Father is like toward yes. us. And I think about the openness. I was talking to, to uh, before service, and we were talking about kids and, I, and about how young children, they can be, you, I mean, like Rennie and Jackson, it's like, I have a fan club. I mean, it's like they are just like. Well, that's are, no kidding. I mean, they are just like, <laughs> they just love, there's this openness uh, to, to me right. that, that they have and to you. Right. Kids just love, um, have this openness and trust that is innately built on the inside of them. Yeah. And it's like, and that's the kind of openness that God wants us to have toward him. And we're going to read some of these scriptures that talk about that. But man, what has robbed us of that is when we have thought God was judicial and judgmental and a taskmaster that was going to punish us if yeah. we did something wrong. Right. And that has robbed us of our childlike approach to God. Yeah. And man, that childlike approach to God is really what we're going to read about that he wants us to have toward yeah. him. And there's all kinds of things that we could talk about in here. So here we go. Yeah. In uh, Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37, out of the Passion Translation says this. Then they came to Capernaum, and as soon as Jesus was inside the house, he's, he asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the way here? <laughs> Just let your mind drift here this morning. Yeah, think about how they're relating to God. Yeah. No one said a word because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. So, you know, and I told Robin even this morning that I didn't, I guess I didn't put certain things together, but I didn't realize that this was a common theme through the Gospels of these guys fighting for position and title and ascendancy and power and control. They were doing it all the time because that is what they had come out of. That's what their religious system of that day was modeling to them, that it was about power and control. It was about moving yourself into a position of authority was what was going to bring you value. And Jesus was, was addressing that. And so... I, and I was thinking about this. Actually, I wrote this down during worship. When your system is challenged, you will do everything you can to protect it, even to the point of killing the one challenging it. 
Man, is that not what they did to Jesus? And is, is that not what they did to Jesus? Wow. wow. So, uh, so whenever, our, whenever our religious structure is challenged, and Jesus was doing that constantly because he was trying to move them into something better, but I believe that he's doing that with you and I today. Yes. He's challenging our religious thoughts to move us into a place where uh, things are operational and manifesting the way that it's supposed to. So that we can really experience life with the Father. Yes. So that on our journey at work or at home, we actually can experience life with the Father. So whenever he said that, then in verse 35, it says, Jesus sat down, called the 12 disciples to come around him and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be content to be last mm. and to become a servant of all. Now, if that doesn't challenge our religious system, I don't know what does. Then he, then he had a child come and stand among them, and he wrapped the child in his arms and said to them, whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me not only welcomes me, but welcomes the one who sent me, which wow. was the Father. And he was, always, he was always taking it from himself in his physical form back to the Father who was one with him, who lived within him, that yeah. it was always the Father doing the work, but it was the Father within him doing the work out of him. Yeah. So That's good. Jesus was correcting the disciples' mindset. I mean, he was trying to get them to move from this religious system they had that was about position and control, and, and he was trying to move them into a, a mindset of relationship, that it was a, not a judicial approach to God, but it was a relational approach to God, that relationship, mirroring that and, and showing them that it was like a relationship with a child. And like we've been reading out of Ephesians chapter 3, it's a family we're a family. We're we're really we're not an army. We're not a you know we're not a uh, uh, I can't think of the other word that I'm that just went out of my head. We're we're a family. Everybody look at somebody and say we're a family. Yeah, we're a family. We're, we're, it's not about anything else, but all of our systems and our structures, even in the New Testament. Uh, they were coming out of an old covenant mindset into a new covenant mindset. As I've been saying, as a Gentile, I was never under that old covenant. So for me, it's not even so much as a, as a new covenant as it is drawing me back to the original intent of what God always wanted all along. And that was for us to be a family and a family cares about one another. A family lives with one another through our mistakes, through our ups and our downs and our ins and our outs. And, and I think we can become judicial even in the, in the way we, we do things. And I think it's hard to break those mindsets because they're so, uh, they're so strong within us. Like I read a couple of weeks ago out of 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not War after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, taking down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of who God is. And who we thought God was is not who Jesus said that he was. And so I've got to look at Jesus and I've got to take everything from that place of simply love. That that's who the Father is. Yeah, because the children weren't coming when they came to Jesus, weren't coming to try to find a position. They were simply coming to experience the love that Jesus was wow. modeling and offering to everyone. And there's several different times throughout the scriptures that you see the children coming to Jesus. And we're going to read one more out of the Passion Translation that's out of Mark 10, 13 through 16. And all of these have the same, uh, right. same theme in them, a little variant. Uh, in Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, it says, The parents kept bringing their little children to Jesus so that he would lay his hands on them and bless them. But the disciples kept rebuking and scolding the parents, the people, for doing it. 
When Jesus saw what was happening, he became indignant with his disciples and said to them, Let all the little children come to me and never hinder them. Don't you know that God's kingdom or life with the Father exists for such as these? Listen to the truth that I speak. Whoever does not open their arms to receive God's kingdom or life with the Father like a teachable child will never enter into it. It doesn't mean that it's not yours, but you will never enter it, into the life-giving uh, dynamics uh, yep. uh, of it. Yep. And so it goes on to say, Then he embraced each child, and laying his hands on them, he lovingly blessed each one of them. And we are all God's children. Yep. Everybody. Yeah. See, God's kingdom, like he was saying, is simply life with the Father. And it's not like Terry was saying. It's not that we're not going, not that we don't have it. Because the truth is, is you were born with, with life, it. It, the life of God on the inside yes. of you. But we have to awaken to the fact that we possess it. And we're not going to be able to really experience the love of the Father unless we come with this childlike openness and trust of our Papa God. Yeah. So Jesus was saying that they were not only going to, that, that you are not only going to experience life with the Father, but He, um, but he intends you to have... Um, a life that is modeling it to other people. Right. So, the, so the, you have to have that mindset of a child in order to be able to model it. That's right. Until we experience the life of the father from the perspective of a child that has a trust. Rennie and Jackson trust me. They don't expect me to do something bad to them. Right. They have this trust that if they come to me and need something or want something, that I'm going to be able to provide that for them, yeah. that I'm not going to get upset with them. I'm not going to get mad at them. They want me to experience life with the father. And I think really as a parent and as grandparents, that is really one of the primary roles that we have in the life of our children and raising them is that they would experience what the Father God is like through us. Yeah. And it's not that correction doesn't come. It's yeah. not that we don't, but it's how we correct them. And it's right. the way that we approach yeah. them, that they would, that they, they, like Jesus, I want my kids and my grandkids to be um, like these kids were with Jesus. They just simply came they to came. receive love. They came to receive love. Yeah. They weren't looking for a right. position. Robin, I feel like that we have complicated things. I think that even the scriptures, because we've not understood right. certain aspects of things, I think even the scriptures have complicated uh, the moments that we're living in. And I believe that we have to, we have to be like a little child coming in a, in a, in a trusting manner uh, so that we begin to uncomplicate these things. The Jewish religious system of that day right. had complicated things, but I'm going to tell you, I think our religious system of this day, of my lifetime, has complicated things where I can't be like a little child and come to the Father in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way of just opening my arms up and allowing Him to receive me because I feel like I've got to jump through all of these hoops and... Uh, Tom, I saw Sherry put up a little picture of your uh, newest granddaughter yesterday, and uh, I thought it was so cute because she put on the heading uh, a, a little bit of heaven coming to us or something like that. And, and that's, that's what we've got to get to in our lives where we uncomplicate things. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question. In your church life, however old you are, do you feel like that your life has been complicated in the past 50, 60, 70 years? See, we've got to uncomplicate this thing and bring it down to the level that Jesus was bringing it down to where we can really begin to uh, allow people to receive what is already within them and begin to walk in that on, on a daily basis. Yep. Really, we have, we have had so many rules and restrictions that there's been no room for love. Wow that we've made no room for there to be love. We've kind of, we've tried to in a, in a, uh, uh, we've tried to fit all of our rules and restrictions into love instead of allowing the love of God to dictate how we look at 
uh, uh, restrictions and rules. Right. Listen, it's not about performance ever that is going to be how I approach my Father God. Yeah. Those kids didn't come up to Jesus quoting all of the, the laws um, to receive love from Jesus. Jesus simply embraced them yeah. like they were. And that's how we saw Jesus model time and time again. Jesus modeled love and acceptance to everyone under their religious system that they said were out. Instead, Jesus modeled love and acceptance. Right. And that's Jesus what he's saying to us. Jesus said to love your enemies. I, I look at the way that Jesus was modeling things to his disciples and time and time again, they weren't getting it because they were so indoctrinated by the system. Now, I believe they eventually begin to come into it, you know, but it took them a while because it was such a foreign way of thinking. Right. It was such a foreign, sometimes whenever I've talked about the love of God in the past, it's such a foreign, because our doctrines of eternal conscious torment, God needed a blood sacrifice to kill his son so that he wouldn't kill you or be angry with you. We've had so many doctrines that have been opposite of the love of God that it, it has not allowed us to, uh, uh, for our minds to change simply because this concept of God's unconditional, unfailing, steadfast love is totally contradictory to a lot of things in the scriptures. That's why Jesus would say things like, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Wow, you know, he good. would flip the script. He was doing that constantly on, uh, on all kinds of levels. Yeah. And, and I, again, Robin and I, the things that we're saying, I'm not, I got a lot of friends that are throwing this out. We're not throwing we're that not out. We're not throwing the Bible out. I'm saying that we're allowing the Bible to help us go to a deeper level in our moment. Yeah, are you all okay with that? Yeah. Do you want to go a little deeper or do you just want to stay where we've been for the last 50 years? How about, do you want to just stay where we've been the last five years? Somebody said to me not too long ago, couldn't we just stay here for a while? Sure you can. You can stay wherever you want. And God will be with and you God there. And God will be with he you. Will. And he'll be in your box. But if there's something better and I can change the planet while I'm here, wouldn't I want to make it a little bit better for my kids or for my grandkids? Yeah. You know? yeah, if we can influence the way our world, I mean, I believe God's called people into every man's world. And, you know, <laughs> and it's like if we can affect the people that we come in contact with and we can show them a different view of the Father, they could see Papa from a different point yeah. of view, that he is loving, that he's not angry at them and he's not mad at them and that he cares about them and that, he, and that at, from that place is where real healthy change will yeah. come in our lives. I'm not saying that we don't, that our, be, that our behavior, God doesn't care about our behavior but not why we think. He doesn't, he doesn't care about our behavior because he's so holy he can't stand to be in the right, side of us if right. we have bad behavior. He cares about our behavior because he knows that it's destructive to us and because as a loving father, he wants our behavior to be healthy so that we can have a healthy life. It's not so yeah. that he can have relationship with us and he needs our behavior to be okay. And that's what we've made it about. We've made holiness and God's uh, love and his holiness about that he can't stand to be in the presence of anything that's right. not okay. Well, Jesus debunked that. His best friends were sinners and publicans. So he was around sin all the time. Oh my gosh. Time. But man, have we lost sight of that. Right. We have lost sight of that because we piled a bunch of rules back on top of that. It's Jesus but. It's Jesus plus. It's love plus all of this. And when it is simply love. Yeah. Amen. So the religious system of that day, Robin, had not presented a loving papa. You can go back and read in your Old Testament where it looks like God said to bash the children's heads up against rocks. You can go back and look at all kinds of negative things. Now, I believe there's a lot of metaphoric and symbolic meaning out of that, but I believe that Jesus began to debunk that reality of who they thought Papa was. I love Paul Young in his... In his uh, a movie called The Shack because not only did he depict God as a woman, he depicted God as a black woman. Are you listening to me? I think that our, our sense of who Papa is has to be obliterated by things in the natural that show us something a little different and get our minds coming out of the foreign way of thinking 
that we have always been involved with. And Terry, I think, Liz, and you've said this statement many times, and this is, we were talking about this this morning, that this statement and how we look at the Scriptures, like Terry said, we're not throwing out the Scriptures, but we need to look at the Scriptures the right way so that they can bring to us the right understanding. So everything in the Scriptures are true, but not everything is truth. It's true that they wrote down their journey from their perspective of what God was like. What they thought God What was they like. thought. And we have to remember, they were like us. You only, when in the beginning of our relationship with anybody, we only can have perspective in that relationship from what we've experienced in the past. You're right. and, and it's just by default that we bring that kind of understanding and, and perspective into our relationship. And that's what they were doing. They had come out of pagan belief systems where gods demanded blood and demanded blood sacrifice. And it was about taking more, the mindset of that, that day, it was about taking more territory and, we can, and, and, and conquering. And, you know, and the truth is, is we can see that in the scriptures, we see glimpses of what God really wanted them to, to be like. Even in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, yeah. that, that he wanted them to be a light to the Gentiles. Yeah. I mean, through Abraham, God wanted the entire world to experience who the Father God was. Because God told him, he said, through you, Abraham, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Because that's the seed that Jesus came through. That's that the right. line that Jesus came through. But instead, they brought their pagan views by de facto into what they thought God was like and began to relate to God that way. And, and you would see things, just like David. I love the story of David and Bathsheba. It's stuck right in the middle of all that law and destruction. Right. Is that there he was, made some of the worst choices that you could think, even right. in today's right, right was, would be to have an affair and then to kill the husband to protect yourself. And he was the king using his authority to be right. able to do that. Right. I mean, that gets about as bad as it gets, even in today's world. And and there he was. That he did he live with the consequence sure, of some of that that, that affected his family. But he, God called him a man after his own heart, not because of his performance, but because he yeah. knew yeah. that God loved him yeah. despite his performance. He knew that God still loved him and was for him regardless of what he just did. And that's why he was a man after God's yeah, own heart, good. not because of what yeah. he did. Those were unhealthy bad choices and yeah. and and but it wasn't but God even then did not view David through his decisions yeah. he viewed Praise he, he viewed David as a child <laughs> of God and that's how he views you that's how he views me and it's from that place man David had a repentant heart right. from the things that he did because he saw how God looked at him yeah. That's why he was able to change his mind even in the moment to even head in, the, in a different direction. Even in the middle of all the law that right. was being How did he in the system. That? He broke um, through the system. He broke through that system. Yeah. Yep. So uh, just a couple of scriptures to throw out right here is like John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. In John 14, 9, when you've seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. So Jesus was bringing a perspective of cool. love that they had never seen before. The Old Testament prophets, uh, Elijah and Moses and all of those guys back there, they didn't, they didn't have a hold of all of what Jesus was saying. But just like David, he began to get a hold of little tidbits of things that moved him a little further in his moment. But thank God we are where we're at in this moment. Yeah. We're not, I'm, I am not where I was a year ago. I'm not where I was five years ago. I'm, I'm moving forward in my, in my life. And, you know, my greatest days are ahead. My greatest days are not behind me. And you say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about living life with the Father on the planet. My greatest days are ahead of me. Look at somebody and say, my greatest days are ahead of me. That, that takes a little bit of childlike faith to believe that. Yes. And it's what they so, so were struggling with. The disciples, you see the struggle that they were having. And I think that we want to, and this is a great example, Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36 says, Now it came to pass about eight days after uh, these sayings that he took Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And he prayed the... And, 
As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in the glory and spoke of his, of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those that were heavy and asleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw the glory in the two men who stood with him. Then they were fully awake, and they saw his glory glory of the men that were with him. And then it happened as they were par- parting from him that Peter said, Jesus, master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. He was like saying, they still were like, okay, looking at we're Jesus. We're going to add Jesus to Moses and Elijah, the yes. law and the prophets. We're just going to add them to what they had already believed. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful. And as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of heaven saying that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And in what they, and I, he's probably, there we go. Sorry, Terry had the paper behind there. This is my beloved son, hear him. Hear and when, him. The, when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. I think that is so significant that he was found alone. No other voices. No other voices. No other voices. Here was a picture to the disciples that had put had been raised to believe the law and everything that and emulate everything that Elijah and Moses had done. And here that Jesus was saying um, when that the Father came and said, "Here is my Son. I'm well pleased with him." Listen to him, hear him, and then when they opened their eyes, Moses and Elijah was gone. The he, law, they were gone. The law and the prophets were gone. And so, what we're supposed—what a picture that we're supposed to listen to and see what Jesus was modeling to us. Yeah. And it didn't agree with what we saw out of no, the Old Testament. No, it didn't Testament. even agree with some of the things in the Old Testament. I mean, you look at like Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 31, where it looks like what they were hearing from God is whenever you go into another nation, kill them all. Kill every one of them. Kill the men, the women, the children, but you can save the virgins for yourself. Hmm. Now, do you think that the Papa that we know said that? I don't think so. I don't believe so. Not from what Jesus was modeling to us. So again, they were, they were writing their journey down to bring aspects of things that we can glean from. Right. But we can't glean what we think the Father is like right. from them. We cannot glean what the Father is like from them. We have to look at Jesus and what he modeled to see what the Father was like. So what's interesting, too, is that after this happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, when um, all that was left standing was Jesus, we can still see the struggle the disciples were having. <laughs> because just a few verses down the road, it's they're, they're arguing again over who's the, the greatest. It says in verse 46, Then a dispute arose among them as to which would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thoughts of their heart, took a little child, and this is what we read earlier, and set him by him. Because this happened right after after these events just happened and said to them, who receives this little child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives him who is sent for who is among the least of you will be the greatest. Yeah, if you're the least, then you'll be the greatest. So he was changing the script. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but if you look around in our world today, whether it's the church, our government, everything is about gaining ascendancy and gaining power and control and money. And I'm telling you, all of those systems are going to come down. I, I, I believe that. All of, all of those systems will come down and bow its knee to the kingdom of God, to life with the Father, to a kingdom of love. And you say, Pastor Terry, have you looked around you lately? Have you looked at the news? Yes, I have. And I believe more today than I ever have that the kingdom of God is going to operate. Life with the Father is going to operate out of people. And this thing is going to change. This thing is not going to end in a negative manner. This thing is the earth and all of its, everything that's here, will, there will be no end to this. And so I believe that, that God is changing the script. God's been flipping the script on you and I for the last 25, 30 years, yeah. Robin. We've been yeah. coming into this slowly, and I'm getting braver and saying things because I don't have anything to lose. I like what I heard one preacher said yesterday. He said, well, I don't know if this is the last days or not, but he said, this is my last days, and I'm going to give it my best shot. 
You understand what I'm saying? But I don't believe we're living. I'm not living in my last days. I believe there's hope. I believe that there's things that can change. But right. we've got to have a belief system like Jesus is presenting here, bringing us out of religion and bringing us into a relationship where things are working the way that they're supposed to. And so even after these, this where he's, they're vying for the greatest and he's giving them the example to come simply oh, like geez. a child, then they go on to a Samaritan village in verses 51 through 54 and, and where Jesus was rejected and then and what John and, uh, James and John's response, but they, they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Remember, they just saw Elijah and, and Moses on the, on the mount. And Elijah did that in the Old Testament. He did. But Jesus was saying Look at no. his response. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you did not know what manner of spirit you were of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to say, them and they went to another village. I mean, yeah. there he is, Jesus, right there is saying that has never been the heart of the Father because it's yeah. in Hebrews it says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if this is what Jesus is bringing to light right here, this has always been what the heart of the Father has been like. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah as far as, you know, uh, Old Testament scriptures, for instance, you know, like Paul wrote in Romans 15, 4, for whatever things were written, because the New Testament was being written whenever he said this, for whatever things were written before, so he's talking about the Old Testament scrolls or scriptures, they were written for our learning that we, through the patient and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And I have to be real honest with you, as Paul was writing that, the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, I'm thinking... From my past and I, the way I've looked at the Old Testament, I didn't find much comfort and hope back there. But if you look at it the right way, if you see it through the lens of Jesus, through the love of God, then you can begin to... Uh, then you can begin to glean comfort and hope out of there. Well, one of the things when you begin to look at it the right way, you just saw how God stuck with them through all the terrible things that they did. <laughs> I mean, man, they, the, when they saw God as judicial and then begin to act out these horrific things that they did to people, God still stuck with them. God never left them. He was always there with them. He was kept trying to move them into a different, even then, into a different way of looking at him. But yeah. in their stubbornness, they hung on to the old way of thinking. And that's what he was, that, that Jesus was doing with James and John, even though Jesus, they had been living with Jesus. Sometimes we say, well, if Jesus was right here, right now, then I, it would clear up all my misunderstandings. But I bet, I bet Davey and I might want to call fire down on Hollister. <laughs> But, you know, I'm thinking there the disciples were with Jesus, with the Father, right there in front of them, right. modeling what it is. And they still had such a struggle to yeah. change the way they were seeing things. But Jesus stuck with them, and he kept teaching them, and he kept trying to bring them along. And that's what he was doing to the religious leaders of that day. Yeah. He kept, and man, he would talk their language with them. He would. He would he, talk their I mean, language. He, would, he would talk, and what we might would think right. was harsh, but, man, he, would, he was trying to speak pace himself with them, speaking yeah, it in the really way that good. they spoke things. And listen, just like you and I were talking this morning about, he turned the money changers over. People will say, well, there, Jesus was angry and mad. Listen, he was turning those things over because he was saying, you have taken life with a father and made it nothing more than making money. There you go. You've made it all about money. And I love what we, those, some of those scriptures said, you cannot serve God and the bank. You can't, those two things don't mix because the Father is not about position and control. It's about simply loving us. So I want to read what I heard in worship this morning. When your system is challenged, you will do everything you can to protect it, even to the point of killing the one that was challenging it. Jesus was challenging their entire system. For 1,500, 1,800 years, they had been sacrificing lambs and turtle doves and all of these kinds of things. And, and then the next week, it was all over. And so they had been making money from that. You couldn't bring in your own lambs or your own turtle doves. You had to buy what they wanted. And you say, Pastor Terry, what you're doing is you're kind of working yourself out of a job. With yeah. the way you're teaching, you're exactly right because it's not about... It's not about the system because here, here's the thing. Ooh, I'm wanting to get up and... 
Our systems, listen to me, the system even of the church right now, we don't want to change. We don't want to even look at what we believe because our, our livelihoods are at jeopardy. If I begin to tell you truth, my livelihood will be at jeopardy. If the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the lawyers had embraced what Jesus said, their entire system of how they their livelihood was going to be at stake. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? It was already going away and they didn't even know it. And that's what Jesus was telling them. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, you know, uh, maybe we shouldn't give to Turning Point Church. No, I think you should give because what we're saying is going to bring a change and a transformation. I'm just saying that it's not about Robin and I. I'm saying it's about us. It's not one particular individual. I'm sorry, I'm preaching a little bit. <laughs> Go for I it. Mean, I, I feel this in my bones. Robin and I have been trying to model something that we've never seen modeled. Even with all of the preachers and the churches that I see out there, very little of this is modeled. Very little of this. It is not modeled in our government. And do you know why? Because a lot of our government are Christians who believe denominationally, and they are the ones ruling in our moment, but they don't rule. They're trying to be the greatest. And Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, be the least and minister to everyone around you. Yeah, that is so good. I mean, we might actually come together for the right reasons. Yes. 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 Yeah, that is good. That is good. So good. It's simply love. It's simply love. It's simply love. You are one with this love. Yep. You are rooted and grounded, like we've been saying, in this love. But you can continue to allow your mind to come into the fact that you've been rooted and grounded. And we've been looking at, at e Ephesians chapter 3. But I want to read one more scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It's like that Romans 15, 4 scripture. Now, all these things happened to them as examples in the Old Testament, and they were written for our admonition, for our growth, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In other words, all of the ages of law and performance-based system, they came to an end 2,000 years ago. And we've been trying to figure this out for 2,000 years. But you start having someone saying stuff like we're saying this morning. And, and listen, whenever people's systems are challenged, people will do everything they can to protect the system to the point of, the one, to, to the point of killing the one challenging it. And I'm challenging it. Jesus challenged Jesus it. Jesus challenged it. We're echoing what Jesus We're echoing challenged. What Jesus said. Yes. And I think when you and I think when you really begin to see that the that the scriptures were written to us and and for us and for our admonition and that that not everything in the scriptures is true about the Father. Right. It was true about maybe what they did in those moments and historically true about what happened, but it is not the truth about our Father God. And when we look, begin to can look at the Scriptures from that standpoint, it begins, we can then begin to interpret our doctrines yeah. through the lens of the love of God instead of trying to reconcile two views of God that can never be reconciled. The right. view they had of the Father in the Old Testament can never be reconciled with the view that Jesus brought. And it's why when he challenged that view, they killed him. Yeah. And, and to really understand that the, even that the cross is simply love. The cross was yeah. not punishment from God to Jesus so he could be okay with it. The cross was the punishment of man for Jesus challenging their religious system. And it was a display of unconditional demonstration of there love to the father, to the people that killed him. And it is the demonstration he has for us every day. So, Robin, as we're ending here, I... Uh... I, wanna, I want us to go back to Ephesians 3, and, uh, you know, it talks about the heights and the depths and the breadths and the lengths of God's yes. love that, that we come into a place of comprehending. Uh, that so that means love. I'm going to have to let foreign thoughts go. 
I'm going to have to let things go in order to continue into the heights and the depths. For instance, I can't believe that God will punish someone eternally for a finite life. Do I believe that God is correcting us? I believe God's correcting us because now. Because He loves us. I believe He will correct us in the future. Yes. Uh, because He loves us. But to believe in eternal conscious torment, I have to throw out love. I have to throw out unconditional love. And, and see, right now, I, just, I know there's a lot of, a lot of us that want to leave an open end for things. I'm telling you, I can't leave an open end for a lot of things like eternal. I can't leave any variance in that. You can't, you can't be open-ended to something that's going to look the opposite of love. Yes. Now, we maybe don't know all of how things are going to completely unfold, but right. we can know that it won't look like something that's opposite of the love of God. Yes. We can know yes. that. We can, we can know, know that. that. Yeah. So it goes on to say, you know, that, uh, let me go back here. It, it goes on to say that, our, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we being rooted and grounded in love, we are inside of us, right. that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, and to know experientially the love of Christ, which passes mere knowledge or mere words on a page or even our spoken words, even the words that I'm speaking this morning, it goes into an experience that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Yeah. And you are filled with all the fullness of God in, in your spirit, but you've got to understand and begin to allow this to be released into your thinking. That's what repentance is, metanoia, a change of your thinking. That's what all of these yes. words are talking about, to comprehend. And then it goes on to say, now to him who is able, and I said a couple of weeks ago that these words to him that is able, these, these words together are one Greek word. It's the word dunamai, it's possibility or, or power. And I'm saying that once you begin to come into the aspects of the love of God, that this, the who in this scripture is you and I. We're not, we're not waiting on God He's waiting on us to embrace this and to walk this out. Because it's like what we started with. When you are simply come to him like a yes. child, then you're going to think everything is able. You're going to think to him who is able. I'm going to believe that if I am one with this love yes. and that that love is, and I can trust it to the nth degree, then I'm going to believe that all things are possible, that God's not withholding anything. And that if I can dream it, think it, and believe it, that God is with me to experience it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Isn't that powerful? So, so, so my thought here as we end this morning is that, uh, that God is not waiting. We're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us to awaken to it, to, to walk in this love. And then it goes on to say in the same scripture in verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly and so when, when we come to these words, these words have a connotation of out of your origin. The exceedingly and abundantly life will come out of your origin or out of the awareness of your origin going back to this childlike faith that Robin and I are talking about, this trust. And so when, when you do something, you're going to do it out of your origin, out of your place where you've always been loved. You've always been accepted. You've always been forgiven. You've always been blessed. There's never been a moment that you weren't, but you may not be living in the awareness of and that. And Terry, that's what Jesus was doing. He was trying to move them from this place of being competitive and trying to have value through their position. And he was trying to bring them back to a, their origin that it was about family and it was about a relationship with a father and it was about being adopted, like you were saying, and right. chosen. And he was yeah. trying to bring them into the mindset of relating to the father. And that life with the father was like life with the family of a loving yeah. Papa God because it was simply about love. That's the origin. We began in that place, and that's the place he wants us to live in. We've had a few interruptions in between. We have. Out of the place of God's always loving us. You know, uh, it's amazing that most of us are even here today because of the things that we've been exposed to and the things that we've heard. But it should bring all of us great hope that we are where we're at today in our, in our uh, ability to move forward 
uh, in, into our future. And Terry, you know, everything around us in our life is, is performance-based. Our jobs, we were talking about this. If I don't go to my job and do my job, I'm going to get fired. I mean, right. you know, I mean, I have an expectation. I am in agreement. I have agreed to do something for a wage. And that is a, not a bad expectation. That is, that is good. But if I can, if I can do, uh, have relationship with my work from a place of already knowing I'm loved, I'm not trying to find my value through the agreement uh, that I've brought to the table right. to do work for them. I am already loved and I'm already have value and I can give it to my job from a place of being healthy right. instead of trying to gain um, uh, power and ascendancy and doing it, approaching it the wrong way and thinking that I'm not going to be good enough unless I get to this certain level or position and, and I'm going to do because this is the most important thing because I have to find my value, my worth this way. I'm going to do it. I might do it dishonest I might do it to step on other people. I might be fighting with yeah. other people just like the disciples were. Or who's going to sit on the right or the left? And I might right. make my whole goal in life that. But if, yeah. if, if, even in my work, even in my everyday life with my family, if it simply comes back to that I understand that I'm loved, if I operate and live my life from the origin of being a loved and being aware of that love, then I am going to be able to operate in those places. Even though there's competitiveness all around me, I'm going to operate from a place of love love and identity and come about it the right way. And that's the power that is at work within you. Yep. The power of his love. The power yes. of his love is what is at work within you. Yep. Now to him who is able. Look at somebody and say, you are able. You are able. See, here's the thing. The church has said God is able. God can do anything. But I think what Jesus was saying was, uh, my father can do anything, but he's living in you. Yeah. The kingdom of God is within you. Life with the father is within you. You can do anything. If you change your mind, there is nothing. Some of our greatest inventions will happen in the next one year, two years, five years, ten years. Some of the most amazing things are going to happen in the future, and I get to get in on it. Somebody say, so do I. You see, we're all going to get in on this. It's going to be amazing. And you say, well, Pastor, anybody that doesn't believe that it's going to happen right here and right now, you believe that the moment you take your last breath, breath that it's going to be amazing on the other side. It's called heaven. So why not just get it? Why not, why not agree with Jesus' prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in that other realm. So let's just see some mighty things happen in our moment and around us. That's awesome. We're going to end with Colossians 1, 28 through 29, out of the passage, Passion Translation. It says, Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and to bring every person into the full understanding of the truth. Wow. It has become my inspiration of passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity and with his power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. Man, we want to trust the love of our Papa. Yeah, praise God. Yep. Father, we just thank you that as we have uh, been in this place today, we thank you that we've been energized, challenged. And Father, I thank you that this next week is going to be an incredible week. We keep Believing, Father, that every day is our next best day. Every week is our yes. next best week. Father, I thank you that we're going to learn to live in our moment with great joy and great peace because of this love that is uh, permeating our entire way of living life. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Father, that as, as uh, everyone that's listening online and, and here in this room, I, Father, I, I think that as we go about our week, we realize that we are a blessed people and that we are going to be a blessing to everyone around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the amen. Lord. Love amen. you guys.